if the stewards could distribute the elements, that'd be great. I've got a, um, a little uh, YouTube video with communion this morning um, because communion or the Lord's Supper or Eucharist, it's known of, with, of many names, by many names. Um, there might be a lot of people that for the first time they've uh, this morning they've ever heard of a, uh, a celebration or a ritual that we do called communion. So there's a little clip that we'll just show if Jason or Shane can put that up just to give you a bit of an overall picture of what communion is about before we partake together. What is the importance of Christian communion? A study of the Lord's Supper is a soul-stirring experience because of the depth of meaning it contains. It was during the age-old celebration of the Passover, on the eve of his death, that Jesus instituted a significant new fellowship meal that we observe to this day. It is an integral part of Christian worship. It causes us to remember our Lord's death and resurrection and to look for his glorious return in the future. The Passover was the most sacred feast of the Jewish religious year. It commemorated the final plague on Egypt when the firstborn of the Egyptians died and the Israelites were spared because of the blood of a lamb that was sprinkled on their doorposts. The lamb was then roasted and eaten with unleavened bread. God's command was that throughout the generations to come, the feast would be celebrated. The story is recorded in Exodus 12. During the Last Supper, a Passover celebration, Jesus took a loaf of bread and gave thanks to God. As he broke it and gave it to his disciples, he said, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. He concluded the feast by singing a hymn, and they went out into the night to the Mount of Olives. As predicted, it was there that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. The following day, Jesus was crucified. The accounts of the Lord's Supper are found in the Gospels. The Apostle Paul wrote concerning the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-29. Paul includes a statement not found in the Gospels. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the blood and body of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. We may ask what it means to partake of the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner. Mm -hmm. It may mean to disregard the true meaning of the bread and the cup and to forget the tremendous price our Savior paid for our salvation. Or it may mean to allow the ceremony to become a dead and formal ritual or to come to the Lord's Supper with unconfessed sin. In keeping with Paul's instruction, we should examine ourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. Another statement Paul made that is not included in the gospel accounts is, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This places a time limit on the ceremony, until our Lord's return. From these brief accounts, we learn how Jesus used two of the frailest of elements as symbols of his body and blood and established them to be a monument to his death. It was not a monument of carved marble or molded brass, but of bread and wine. He declared that the bread spoke of his body, which would be broken. There was not a broken bone, but his body was so badly tortured that it was hardly recognizable. The wine spoke of his blood, indicating the terrible death he would soon experience. He, the perfect Son of God, became the fulfillment of countless Old Testament prophecies concerning a Redeemer. When he said, Do this in remembrance of me, he indicated this was a ceremony that must be continued in the future. It indicated also that the Passover, which required the death of a lamb and looked forward to the coming of the Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world, was fulfilled in the Lord's Supper. The new covenant replaced the old covenant when Christ, the Passover lamb, was sacrificed. The sacrificial system was no longer needed. The Lord's Supper, or Christian communion, is a remembrance of what Christ did for us and a celebration of what we receive as a result of his sacrifice. Got questions? The Bible has answers, and we'll help you find them. What did you think? <laughs> I thought it was a great little overview, that, that um, 
video put together by the Bible Project. So you've got, I hope by now, everybody the elements. Um, and as as talked about, um, and Paul shared in the Gospel, Second Corinthians, that we reflect on it. Um, ourselves and examine ourselves before we come together with the communion so just encourage you to take a moment now to reflect on your heart condition and and as we come together with communion this morning to yeah to deal with anything before God before partaking together with this both remembrance of of his sacrifice but celebration of of his coming again so yeah just take a few moments now Thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice for us. And we do this in remembrance of you. We recognise that you sacrificed yourself to bring the new covenant, the new promise of everlasting life to to the world. We recognise how you suffered, and this is symbolised in the broken bread and the blood, These simple elements, though, so powerful to remember what they symbolise. We celebrate too, Lord, because we know you didn't remain dead and broken. You rose to life and you are coming again. And we celebrate and we do this until that time comes when we meet together forever. So we thank you now as we partake in communion. Amen. Let's just take a moment a little longer. I just... You spent all of eternity with him. Just take another moment. Just thank him for something. Just get into a place of thanksgiving. There's power and authority in the place of thanksgiving. I love that love that verse that we can't have anxiety, but in everything for a supplication of thanksgiving we present... To God and the peace that passes all understanding. We guard our heart and mind in Jesus. Just this moment, maybe something's gone on this week. Just let that peace come over you. Let just authority just reign in your life. That everything else goes quiet and just, just goes dim in the light of His presence. God, we just thank you. Just give it ten more seconds. Count on more. Cool on more. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for who you are. Good morning, church. How are you guys going? Doing well, dude. We were out for breakfast this morning with. Um, Pastor Brett and Scotty, and it was sunny for a second. We got a little bit of sun, didn't we? <laughs> Just loving it, guys. Well, if you're new to our church, welcome. If you're online, welcome to you guys too. How good was that communion message? Thank you, Lance, and the worship. Just authority and power. So just, yeah, just love the worship team coming and just coming and sharing. So guys, we are blessed to have Pastor Brett and Scotty come and share with us. Let's give them a hand. 
I'm not going to say too much, but last night was incredible. We saw healing, we saw miracles. I'm not going to take detract from what Brett's going to share, but just we saw people just totally. We saw one lady running around. I'm not going to take away the story, but just totally healed. And we're expecting tonight at four o'clock. We're having an open service, a hope of healing service. There will be miracles. There's no doubt. There is no doubt. So all we need to do is just bring our friends so they can receive it. Can I get an amen to that? Bring your friends, bring your neighbours. They will be radically changed tonight. So four o'clock service. We're going to have some great fun this morning as well. Come and check that out. We've got some pastors from all over churches, all over Gippsland coming along. So we're blessed to have them. Just a quick announcement. We've got our Constitution Special AGM next week. Got that right? Yes. So we are changing our constitution. Our constitution was uh, a little bit of a joke. Uh, it was typed on a typewriter, our last constitution. <laughs> so that's how old it is. So we're updating that, and we're just really excited. On that note, the reason we're doing that is because we've got a passion and a vision to radically change how school is done in Warrigal, and we're launching a school. On that note, I'm going to ask for Suzanne to come and share really quickly and give us an update. You guys are...
morning, everyone. Um, I'm here for the Silver Seniors this week. Anyone who's over 60 or 60 and over is welcome to join us. You can sneak in if you've got silver hair, we won't notice. <laughs> but we'd love you to turn up. We're going to have a meeting. If you would like to come, it's not a meeting, it's like eating. <laughs> That's a meeting for us, isn't that good? That's why we're a social group. So you're invited if you're 60 or over and we'll be meeting on the 16th of August, the Tuesday in the lunchtime and see me with for details and I'd like to plug the prayer meeting Tuesday at 10.30 here at the church. Bless you all. Thanks, Marilyn. That's awesome. Got a great community there. I just We met with the uh, Cairo executive principal of the whole campuses and we just shared our vision in our heart. Uh, it was just a great time and he was excited, we were excited. So we just love how we as a school, there's going to be five new schools in the next 10 years in Warrigal and we have a heart that they'll be cruel Christian schools. Can I get an amen to that? And um, we just have vision for that. And just working with a partnership of unity. How cool is that? So it was awesome. Um, I'm just excited about that. So uh, we are in that. I got the date wrong. Sorry. 21st of August is our special general meeting for the Constitution. I'm just ahead of my time. <laughs> anyway, so I'll let you that. 21st of August, guys. So we're blessed to have that. Um, I just want to share about giving before we take up our offering and, and um, tithes. Um, my son just got a new car, and it got, yes, his first ever car. Um, and so I just reminded me of my first car 22 years ago. And I was a guy that didn't know, my dad taught me how to change oil and all that stuff. I didn't know much about wheel alignments. So you know what I did? I, my car started like dragging to the side of the road, and I'm like, nah, I'll be fine. Three or four months later, my, I hear this pop in the tyre and I get pull over and I look, oh, my tyre. And I put my hand in and it's busted down to the metal. So the tyre had worn out so much that the, 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 the wire's sticking out. And God just spoke to me this morning. Sometimes when things get a tiny bit out of alignment and we ignore it and ignore it and ignore it, the whole car can actually can be very dangerous. And I know uh, tithes and offering is only a small thing. But when it's out of alignment, it can become a big thing. We've just done a whole month of stewardship campaign and understanding how to steward things in our life, not just finance, but all areas of our lives. Now, God loves us so much, and he wants us, he's given us authority as we are mature Christians. You know you're a mature Christian, a new creation. And God just spoke to me, just when something gets out of alignment, it can lead into big issues and big costs down the air. And God just said, just share with the people. Make sure your time, with your family, your relationships, with your finance, with your work, with all those areas are in alignment. Otherwise, you're going to be me and that, ignore that noise in the engine. <laughs> Who's got the um, engine light that just flashes and you just say, oh, just ignore that. Don't ignore that. <laughs> I was in a pastor's car on the weekend and his, his car makes all these noises. He drives a, he drives a Ford. And he goes, it just speaks to me all the time. And it's like engine light, oil light. I'm going, I'm just praying in the tongues as I was driving. <laughs> anyway, so we're just going to take our tithes and our offering. This is for our members too. If you're a guest here, you're welcome to give. But this is for our members to bring radical change. We employ a youth leader. We employ a generation leader. We employ a kids leader to be able to just pour into our community. So we're blessed to be able to do this. And that's where our tithes and offering we are Got a generosity month that's finishing up this week that we're uh, sponsoring a um, school in South Sudan and we're doing a great job over there. So that's awesome. I've got the, yep, Tives Missions is there too. So cool. I'm talking way too much. Guess what time it is? Kids. It's Kids Church. If you have got kids here, we have got the Kids Church on. Adrian's doing an amazing job over there. So head over. Parents, please sign your kids in and head over and have a great morning. Awesome. All right, guys. I'm so blessed. Brett, Pastor Brett Linder and Scotty, Brett's been with us a few times. I think at least it's our third time here. Third. Yeah, and we're so blessed to be able to see Radical. Last time he was here, we saw, I think, 22 people, new salvations. Wow. It was probably the most significant, one of the most significant events in our church, and wow. just to see radical change. He was just at a church um, down in Kingston, and he saw in one service 30 people give their life to the Lord. He's empowered. He's been here this morning. I'm going to sneak this one about. He was here this morning at like dawn praying over this church. 
He's ready, he's primed, and we're going to see God move and see Jesus' name made famous. Can we stand up and give a hand to this great man of God? Cheers. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Praise God. Amen. Who's excited to be in church this morning? Grab a seat. Melbourne's turning on great weather. Sydney weather's been pretty ordinary lately, I must say. Twice now I've been to Melbourne, or been not to Melbourne, but to Victoria, I should say, in the last couple of months. And every time I come here, the sun's shining and it's warm and it's nice outside, so that's exciting. Praise the Lord. Who's happy to be alive? Give me a wave. Who's got a pulse right now? Yeah. Who's excited about the things of God? Who enjoyed the worship? Who's got a voice out there? Who can give glory to God? Who'd like to make some noise right now? Come on, there's a shout of praise on the inside of you that wants to come out. Here's another go. Let's have another try. We can do better than that. Amen. Come on, let's glorify him. Thank you, Jesus. Something that happens when you break that sound barrier. Victory has a certain sound. It's rarely ever quiet. Did you know that? Victory is always noisy. When Collingwood wins a grand final, God forbid. But anyway, when Collingwood wins a grand final, it's never quiet, is it? Come on, church should never be quiet, should it? We've won the greatest victory. Amen. We have more to celebrate. We've got all eternity to celebrate that lies ahead of us here today. Amen. We've got victory over every area of our life. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. How much? All that is within me, praise his holy name. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Here they come. He forgives all your sins. How many? All your sins. He heals all your diseases. How many? All your diseases. That includes cancer. That includes heart disease. That includes whatever, diabetes, that includes every kind of terminal thing, that's everything, he heals all your diseases, he redeems your life from the pit, when you're in a hole, when life gets impossible, when everything goes wrong, when it all starts to cave in around you, the Bible says he redeems your life from the pit, he crowns you with love and compassion, he satisfies your desires with good things, so your youth, is renewed like the eagles. I've got a word right now for the over 60s, for the silver, silver guys out there. Amen. You don't have to be silver, by the way, if you don't want to be. I'm telling you, the older you get, the healthier you become. Come on, you can claim that. I've just given you a scripture to stand on. If you want to get healthy, you can get healthier as you get older. There's nothing to stop you. Moses did that in the Old Testament. It says he was 120. Who wants to get to 120? Come on. He's 120 and his eyesight wasn't dim, nor was his strength abated. He was stronger, just as strong as he was when he was in his 30s. He was ready. Joshua was the same. He was 80. And he went to Moses because he hadn't, he hadn't got his inheritance yet. And he says, I want such and such a hill over there for, my, for all my clan. We want all that block of land out that way. He says, I'm ready to go and get it. Amen. I'm still, I can still fight just like I could when I was in my 40s. Give me the go. I want to go. And Moses said, go, take it. So off he went. And he took the land. Amen. There's things in your life that you want to take. You can have them here today. The Bible says, whatever things you ask, when you pray. What's it say? Certain things? No, whatever things. Mark eleven twenty four. whatever things you ask when you pray, how do you get them? You ask when you pray and then you believe that you receive them and you will have whatever it is that you've asked for. Oh, we serve an awesome God. And we just, we just that's, that's what we get to do with this ministry. We just get to help people ask God for what they want. Believe with them and assist them with the word of God, with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, we assist them to receive what God has for them. We had a fantastic time last night. Give me a wave if you were here last night, some of the leaders. We had people come from Maui and everywhere. It was amazing. 
And um, there's one young lady here. I'd like her to come forward who got prayed for last night. And her name is Remy. Remy. That's right. Remy, would you come? Would you pop? Would you come out here? Don't be shy. Come to the front. She said, oh, pastor, I might be nervous. I said, you'll be fine. I'll have a microphone switched on. Pray. Yeah, come on. Give Remy a big hand. Come and stand over here, Remy. Now, Remy got prayed for. She had fibromyalgia, didn't you? Yes. And how long had you had that for? About 15 years. 15 years. And what was it like? It was pain all over your body normally. Is that correct? Yeah, just pain everywhere, especially my, around my ankle, my back. Yep, everywhere. And, and we had a prayer last night for people who had pain in their bodies. And Remy, come to the front. And tell us what happened. Um... I wasn't going to come anywhere if he had said, come for prayer, but because he was specific. He said, if you have pain, and because he's, he mentioned that, I came forward, and I was prayed for, and it was um, a feeling of freedom. And I couldn't sleep last night till 2 a.m. because I'm not used to sleeping without tossing and turning and changing pillows and everything. But I just laid there. I was still. And I tried to see whether it was real, that I'm not feeling pain. Eventually, I, I slept. And I woke up this morning. It was like, okay. I woke up at 7 a.m. I didn't believe it because usually at 8.30, I'm still struggling to get up. So I got up, and it was strange, but it was good. There's no pain. No pain. Come on, give God some glory. God bless you, Remy. Well done. Isn't that amazing? Give this lady a big hand. You can grab your seat now. We're done. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. We've never... That was fibromyalgia. I've lost count of how many people we've seen healed of fibromyalgia. I was saying just last night, one of my, the ladies that I train in my prayer team at our church, we've been in there for, for 20 odd years. We're at our last church in Sydney till just recently where God's um, placed us in another location. But we served in that church faithfully for 20 years and we built up lots of ministers who could pray for the sick, who would help us um, off the back of meetings. And this one lady, one of my key ladies actually, she said, well, she says, I've got a sister of mine who lives in Perth, and, and this sister's got all these health conditions. She had um, fibromyalgia, which was the same as that. She had chronic fatigue. She had Ross River fever, and she had depression. And she said, what do I do? And I said, tell her to get on a plane and come to Sydney, and God will heal her. So she got on a plane. She flew to Sydney. The same week, we convened a special meeting at church in the pastor's office where about four or five of us met there. Scotty came and the, the, the lady from Perth and her sister, who was my prayer person, she came. And I think there was one... And that's right, the lady had, had two of her daughters who were, back, who, who, who were um, away from the Lord. They came. And um, this, is, this is going live, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'm allowed to say this, so it's all good. And I've just got to think what I say and how I say it. And, and so she comes in, and we pray for her two, her two daughters who were suffering from depression and other things, and they both get released, just like that. They both receive Christ and get filled with the Holy Spirit. They're speaking with other tongues. And then the mum, we pray for the mum. Power of God comes on her, and all her pain instantly left. The depression left. The Ross River fever left. The chronic fatigue left. She's bound, I've got videos of her... Um, two and three months later, just springing around like a 16-year-old, just full of life. And then she got filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, and then they flew home the next day back to Perth, healed and happy in Jesus' name. Amen. God will come through. And we're going to see people today, this morning, and tonight. This morning, I've got a limited time to pray for the sick, but tonight we're opening up the altar. And we will pray until the cows come home. I grew up on a dairy farm, so I know what that means. And nobody will miss out. 
You might have to come back tonight, but I'm telling you, if you come tonight, you will not miss out. Let's go to our Bibles in 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. 2 Kings, the Old Testament. This is about a story about a man called Naaman. The Bible says, Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Naaman was an important man. He was, he was one of the highest officials in all the land. Beneath the king, he was probably the number two guy. He was the head of all the army. He wasn't, he wasn't a child of God. He wasn't part of the family of God. He wasn't an Israelite person. But even though he was like what we would call a heathen person, someone who doesn't know God, the Bible says that God used him. God can use anybody. How much more can God use you and I? God used him mightily. Except for one thing. The Bible says he had leprosy. Now, I don't know if you'd imagine what this would be like for this guy, but when you had leprosy, it was different from every other sickness of the day because leprosy was the thing that you couldn't heal. It was a sickness that would never go away. It was a sickness that would take you out of society and isolate you and ultimately you would die from it because of all the wounds and sores and and, 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 and disease that your body would, would get because of this numbing condition, you would eventually die as a leper, somebody, an outcast. There was a lot of superstition around this disease. They thought it was contagious, they thought it was unclean, and you had to be separated from the rest of society and live out there with all these other lepers in a leper colony where one by one they would gradually die off without any help, without any aid, maybe a few scraps, some goodwill people might drop them off a bit of leftovers every now and then and they just would get by. It was a terrible life. So he first started to get this leprosy and he would cover it up because he's an important man. He's a leader. You can't be a leader and have leprosy. He would have to cover it up because if people, they, no one could know. He's a man of influence in his realm, mixing and leading and mixing with the sort of people he met with he couldn't have anyone ever know that he had this disease. His job was finished the minute he had this disease. And eventually it got so much so that he couldn't cover it up anymore. You see, leprosy in the Bible is like a type for sin. And the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the kingdom. And what people do is they try and cover it up. They know they've got sin in their life. They know they're doing things that God is not okay with. They feel the guilt of that and they try and cover it up. But sooner or later, you get to a point where you can't cover it up anymore. It starts to show. It starts to become known. People start to find out. Sometimes you just look on someone's Facebook or their social media and you can... Wow, I didn't realise that person was into all this kind of stuff. Sooner or later, the secret's going to get out there. And that's like that with all of us. But there is, there's only one person who can deal with that sin aspect in our lives. And there's no remedy. There's no potion. There's no doctors. There's no medicine. There's no kind of counselling. There's none of that will ever get rid of the guilt of sin in our life. When David fell, he said, God, forgive the guilt of my sin. It's not just the sin, it's the guilt. It's the complex that goes with it. But the blood of Jesus, amen. The blood of Jesus is what sets people free. The blood of Jesus is what gets people healed, amen. When they let down the leper through the roof, Jesus said, which is it easy to say, your sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk. And so... Jesus is the only one who can deal with this life issue, this sin, which is a leprosy type, in our lives and set us free. There's no other alternative. The Bible says no man can redeem the life of another in Psalm 49 or give to God a ransom for him. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment 
is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. There's no payment that any earthly person can make. Why is that? Because Jesus was, whilst he was an earthly man, pure as a human can be, he was also God in the flesh and pure and sinless. A sinful man can't pay the price for another sinful man because the first sinful man's life is not worth enough. He can't even cover himself. He can't determine his own future, let alone the future of someone else. Where Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one and only Son from above. The Bible says that he was tempted in every way, but yet was without sin. He was the pure, spotless, perfect sacrifice. He didn't need to die for himself. He was already free. But he could choose to die for you and I and pay the price. And on the third day, the Bible says God raised him from the grave. So he's been through the other side. He's got the key to eternity. He's overcome sin, death, and the power of the devil. Amen. When we receive him, we become united to him. This is how we live now. We unite ourselves to Christ. We unite ourselves to his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Praise God. We unite ourselves to his death. In that as he died on the cross, so too we can have the power to die to our sins. It's just a choice. It's a decision. It's a mindset. It's a surrender that we go through. We die. How do we die? Because we're in him and he died. And and it happens in the waters of baptism. Who has been water baptized today? Maybe if you haven't been water baptized, this is something you need to tell your pastor and you'll get to it quick smart. When you become water baptized, you go down under the water, signifying the death where you go down under the water and your sins go down under the water. Just like the people of Israel, when they come up out of Egypt, when Moses, the great deliverer, that's Christ, they put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their house and they were delivered that night. Why? Because of the blood. And the Bible says that the angel of death, which was sent over all that land because of all the evil and the sin and everything that took place, it had to happen. Judgment had to happen so that justice would prevail in the land. Because God's into justice. He's not into judgment, but he is into justice. And if you want justice, you've got to have judgment when there's evil. Otherwise, there's injustice. When evil gets left unpunished, that's injustice. That's turmoil. That's strife. That's a place you don't want to live. And so the angel of death was over the land. And when they put the blood of the lamb, which is representative of the blood of the lamb, the lamb, the sin, the, 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 the Passover lamb, Christ himself, as we heard in the, in the communion this morning, on the doorpost, then the angel passed over and the people of God were led out by their deliverer, who was Moses. Praise God. But it wasn't very long. And they came to their first obstacle. The enemy was hot pursuing them, coming in behind them like a flood behind them. And they had this wall, they had this sea, unpassable in front. They couldn't go forwards, they couldn't go backwards. What are they going to do? And that's what happens to so many Christians. They have the blood of Christ on their life, they become born again, they become saved and off they go. And then all of a sudden, everything starts to come unstuck. Anyone been there? Amen. Amen. Things get stirred up from the past or you confront things that you never saw coming. And this, this going under the water, Moses lifted up his rod. God told him, lift up your rod and you'll see the deliverance today. Lifted up his staff before the water and the sea parted. And there's a wall of water on either side. And then the people of God walk through on dry ground. Impossible. Walk through. God does miracles. He's a God of the impossible. He'll get you through whatever situation you're facing. Just like that. They walk through on dry ground. They walk through and up and out the other side. I'm paraphrasing this. And then the enemy comes roaring into the middle of the the sea behind them in pursuit of them. Meanwhile, the Israelites are out on dry ground now. Enemies right in, all the armies right in the middle. And then Moses lifts up his same staff again. And the sea covers over 
and demolishes and smashes the, the enemy's army. And the Bible says there's not one survivor. Not one survivor. The past was now completely cut off. The people were truly free. And my friends, that's what happens when you unite yourself with Christ in water baptism as you go through. And when Christ puts up, when Moses, or it's Jesus really, but it was Moses, but it was a symbol of Jesus, the great shepherd, amen, putting up his staff over those waters, they come crashing down and destroy the enemy. And when you get yourself water baptized, I'm telling you, what you're doing is you're destroying the enemy who was once pursuing you in your life. And then from that day, you can truly be free in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen from anyone here today? It is such a powerful thing. And so many Christians don't live that way. They haven't united themselves with Christ. And they wonder why they suffer. They wonder why their life goes crazy. They wonder why they've always got turmoil and strife at home and with their children and at work and... Things never work out and they're going broke and there's all these things, one after the other after the other. You know, they pray and nothing ever happens. And the reason why is because they're not united with Christ. See, when we receive Christ, I'm getting off my preaching now, I'll get back to it in a minute, but when we receive Christ, the Bible says we unite to his death, his burial, and his resurrection, praise God. Amen? So he's... His power, his freedom, his fullness comes to live on the inside of you when you become born again. And then there's one more thing that happened after that, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and then Pentecost, amen. amen. Then you become empowered to be his witnesses where you get filled with boldness. But a lot of Christians, they don't even have the resurrection on the inside of them. There's no life there. They're, they're kind of stuck. And the reason why they're stuck is because they're not resurrected. And the reason why they're not resurrected is because they never really died in the first place. God can't resurrect something that hasn't died. You've got to have a death before you can have a resurrection. There's a surrendering in our lives where we come to Christ and we say, God, I'm just surrendering everything. I'm let go of my will and I'm choosing just to hold on to you. Nothing I can do to get me through this. Nothing I can do can get me saved. I'm going to quit trying to be, I'm going to try and be good, but I'm going to quit relying on my goodness, on my record, on my achievements. No, it's not my study. It's not my achievements. It's not where I grew up. It's not how things are going right now. It's only Jesus that gets me through. It's you and you alone. It's his righteousness. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not yours. Whew. That's a relief. His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. It's his righteousness. All we have to do is hang on to him with all our might, with all our soul. Hang on to him. Let go of our achievements. You see, I, I grew up in the, in the country where we used to go to the footy. It was AFL. We'd rock up to the footy ground. You'd get, and you'd park your car right to the fence. And, um, and all the cars. Every, and, and, and when your team gets a goal, you'd toot the horn. Remember those days? And as kids, we'd always go. Our, our, our family went to the footy every week. My dad played. He was actually one of the, he was a star footballer could have played, he got invitations to play in Melbourne back in the day. He won the Azai medal, which is the Hume League best and fairest. And, um, and he was very, very good. Anyway, so we would go to footy every, every single week. And at our local footy ground, we had the old scoreboard. And us kids, we used to do the scoreboard. You had these, these numbers on sheets of tin, you know, and you'd be up there, four goals, three to two goals, one, you know, and... Someone, your, your team would get a goal, can you give me a five? And someone would throw up a five and you'd stick that on and take the four off and you'd turn the five over and it would become a six, you know. Remember the days? Anyway, every now and then, one of the spectators would come by and they'd say, oh, that score's wrong, you know. They'd carry on and, and we'd, say, we'd say, no, it's not, it's right. But at the end of the quarter, the goal umpire would come round with his little book and he'd say, boys, you need to change that five to a six, you missed one and because he would keep his own score, you see. And, um, and so if you wanted to know how your team was doing, you'd just look up at the scoreboard. Well, you know, we've got a scoreboard. 
in our own life. And you want to know how you're doing? You look up at your scoreboard and you think, oh, doesn't look real good. I messed up today. Had a few things go wrong this week. But when you become born again, your scoreboard becomes Jesus' scoreboard. So your score is what he scored. And he got 100%. Every exam he ever sat, he got 100%. So even on your worst day, once you're born again, when you look up at your scoreboard, what do you see? You see his score. Your scoreboard is gone, it's finished. Because your scoreboard is called self-righteousness. And that's a stench. That's, that's, that's a no-go. That, that's, a, that's a dishonor to God. That'll, nev- that, that'll just bring condemnation and wrath and everything else. And a lot of Christians suffer from condemnation because as soon as you've got your scoreboard that you're looking at, guess who comes to condemn you? And he's got every right to, the devil. Because you're looking at your score, you go, oh, did you see that? That was a blooper. Man, imagine if anybody ever found out what you did then. What if the pastor knew? Praise God. But you see, that's why the Bible says in Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because you're in Christ Jesus, you've got his scoreboard, so nothing can condemn you. Isaiah 54 says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue, here it is, every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will condemn. Why? This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, declares the Lord. God is allowed to give you his righteousness. Why? Because you've united yourself to Christ in his death and burial and his resurrection and Christ has paid for all of your sins with his sinless, perfect, sacrificial life that he gave for you and I on the cross that's completely legal and just. It satisfies all the requirements of the law, amen? There is therefore now no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the... I've forgotten it now. The spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Come on. It's a law. It's set you free. It's legal. It's a document. It's binding and you can't undo it. All you have to do is unite yourself to Christ. And so this man, he needed a saviour. He needed healing. And the Bible says, bands of raiders from Aram had come out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife, this little slave girl. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. This young little slave girl, she's like an evangelist. A little slave girl gets word into the ear of the second most important man in the land. And this is what she said. Well, look, you know, if you'd like to be healed, you should give this a try. No, that's not how she said it. Let's have a look again. If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him. Come on, he will cure him. There's no ifs or buts. It's a dead set certainty. He will set him free. You give your life to Christ, you will be born again. You will come alive on the inside. You will get out of the pit that you're in. You will live a different way, amen. You will walk into eternity of assurance, having your eternal destiny secured in Jesus' name. There's no ifs or buts. There's no maybes. Amen? Amen. Give, me a, give me a shout. Say something. Amen. Praise God. Naaman heard this. And so now Naaman goes to the king. Can you believe it? From a little girl who just spoke up. But when we speak up, it's got to be faith. It's got to be boldness. I said last night that shyness is from the devil. You might say, well, I'm shy. Well, you need to get unshy, amen. And God will help you. 
He gives boldness when the Holy Ghost comes. That's why we need Pentecost, amen, because we're all shy. But you get Pentecost on you and you won't be shy any longer. You say, oh, well, I tried that and I'm still shy. Well, you haven't tried it right. You can't get Pentecost and stay shy, people. If you call yourself a Pentecostal and you're shy, you're not really a Pentecostal. Let me tell you right now. Amen. You find a verse in the Bible to prove me wrong. <laughs> you're cheeky, some of you. And so he saw the king and the king goes, by all means, go. To, uh, um, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl of Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram, Aram replied. He says, I will send a letter to the king of Israel, which was where the prophet was. So now this little girl told her master... Who's the second? Well, she told his wife, which is sometimes a smart way to get through to an important person as you talk to their wife. But told, told the master, the second most important guy, who then tells the king, who's the king, and then the king writes a letter, which is like a travel visa, a special permit, so that when he finds, so that when the king of Israel, who's like an enemy in a, in a sense, finds one of the officials walking around in his country, he's got a letter to show why he's there. He's not there to spy or to cause trouble, amen? This is how it gets to the top. If we will just speak it out, if we will declare the gospel just like it is, amen? We don't need to make it seeker sensitive. We just need to tell it like it is with faith. You tell the word of God with faith and anyone will believe you. And they can receive. I had a guy... Just recently, uh, uh, one of the guys who, I'm a mechanic by trade, he drops all my oil drums of oil off each month. And I had a delivery coming, and I get a phone call from him, and they just normally drop them off, and I'm, I'm out on jobs around different locations. And um, he rings me up, he says, I've got this oil coming in a half an hour's time. I said, right, that's good. He said, I need you to be there. I said, why? He said, oh, because I've, I've, my back's just gone. It's completely gone. I've... I've, I've had one operation on it and I'm probably going to have to have another major operation on it. I'm not, I'm not allowed to lift anything. I'm like, oh, well, Scotty's there, but that's going to be a bit weird. Getting, she could do it. She'd probably just lift one each hand and just plonk them down, you know, like most women. But anyway, I said to her, I said to him, I said, look, I was only not far away. I said, look, I'll be there by such and such a time. Anyway, I got there just at the right time as he was arriving and, um, and I was just chatting away. And I said, look, I said, um, about your back... I'll talk to you about that in a minute because I can help you with that. He goes, oh, that's, a, that's good. And so we unloaded the drums and did all that. Now I said, now about your back. I said, if you let me pray for your back, God will heal you and you can be free of that. How about, how about we pray for it? And he goes, okay. And he's, I think he's like a Middle Eastern kind of guy, really nice guy actually, big, big strong fellow, way bigger than me. Anyway, I laid my hands on his back and prayed and I felt the power of God going into him. I said, you're going to be set free. I prayed in Jesus' name, released the power of the Holy Spirit on him. And I just, I didn't rush it because I'm not, I'm bold, amen. I'm not scared, I'm not a shy. We're God's agents. We don't have to fear anything, amen. I'm no different to you, amen. I have all the same thoughts, trust me. Anyway, I prayed for him and just let the power of God just soak into him. I said, there you go, go try that. And I said, go for a walk over there. And he sat and he, under his breath, he's going, you're kidding me. You're kidding me. And he comes back. I said, touch your toes. And he bends down, touches his toes. He said, it's gone. He said, it doesn't hurt. He said, how did how'd you do that? I said, no, no. I said, it wasn't me. That was the power of the Holy Spirit. That was Jesus who set you free. The reason why that worked is because Jesus is real and God raised him from the dead and he likes you. Amen. And I said, now you... I said, now the ball's actually in your court. I said, God has healed you right now. But it's up to you what you're going to do. Can you ask God to be your healer, but say, I don't want to have anything else to do with you? Do you think that'll hold? And he goes, no, that's no that wouldn't work. I said, sure wouldn't. So you, you're going to have to decide what you're going to do here. I said, I'll tell you what. 
I said, you're not ready to decide right now, I can see that. But I said, here's my phone. I opened it up to, the, to a new contact. I said, put your phone number in there. And in a couple of weeks' time, after I get back from this next lot of meetings in Victoria, I'm going to text you and give you a call and ask you how you're going. Is that all right if I do that? And he goes, yeah, that's all right. So he, he wrote his number in my phone and his name and hit the enter. And I got his number in my phone now, so I'm going to ring him up. And I'll hit him up. I'll say, well, what have you done? When are you going to decide? Time's short, amen? amen. Time's short. See, we got the solution to everyone's problems. I'm not going to finish my preach. I haven't finished a preach in 12 years. <laughs> Praise God. Who's got pain in your body? It was a good one too. A good preach, that is. Give me a wave if you've got pain. All right. I'm going to start praying this morning for people who've got pain in your body. All those people with pain in your body, why don't you come and sit in this vacant row up the front here? Would you do that? Just so that it's easy for me to get to you. Just begin to make your way to the front. And the Bible says... In verse 5, so Naaman left taking with him 10 talents of silver. He's a generous man, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 sets of clothing. You see, he must have taken his wife with him, amen. That's why he needed all those extra sets of clothes for her, praise God. Anyway, some people think that's funny. The, the, then he took the letter to the king of Israel and this is what the letter said. With this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel saw this, he freaked out. He said, do you think I'm God? How can I cure someone of their leprosy? And then we read on down to verse 8. And here's where it gets exciting. Verse 8, it says, when the Elijah, sorry, Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent them this message. He said, why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. If he was here, he would say, have the man come to this church, amen. If you're sick, if you've got problems, if you're stuck, if you need a miracle, come to this church and you'll know that there is a God in in this town in Warrigal, amen. You'll know. All we have to do is be bold and be loud, come on, amen. and speak up out there amen. and tell people where their help comes from. Amen. Doesn't come from the east, doesn't come from the west, doesn't come from the north, doesn't come from the south. It comes from above, amen. amen. That's how you'll be set free. A little servant girl can convince a person the second most highest person in the land, a little slave girl. Why did she convince him? Because she was 100% sure. There was not a doubt in her mind. She had faith. That's what faith is. Have faith in God, Jesus said. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says... See, people of faith, they can't keep quiet. Some people say, oh, I pray quietly at home. Oh, well, that's nice. But no one will hear that. Amen? That won't shift the town. Sure, prayer is a big part of it. I pray lots too. But it's more than just what you're doing at home. You've got to start to speak it. We all have to start to speak it. And none of us are shy, remember, because we all got the Holy Ghost. Amen? How does, how does that boldness work? Well, you just don't magically become bold overnight no boldness is like all the gifts of the holy spirit it's even like the gift of tongues you have to actually step into it it doesn't just fall on you and you've got it no you actually embrace it and you begin to operate in it that's how it works i know some pentecostals who were spirit filled in 1976 praise god but they ain't spirit filled any longer they could talk in tongues, but they only do it for five minutes at the prayer meeting and every now and then when there's a tragedy or a, 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 a um, what do you call it, emergency going on. It doesn't do any good to them. Sure, they can, but do they? It's not whether you can, it's whether you do. When you pray in tongues, you release the power of heaven. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. 
And boldness is another. It's, it's not listed as a gift in the Bible, but it operates very much like that. The way you get boldness is you just turn your voice up. Amen. You get on the front foot like this. And you say, I'm going to tell this person.